Lead us, O Father, to thy heavenly rest. However rough and steep the path may be, through joy or sorrow, as thou deemest best, until our souls are perfected in thee. <clears throat> Please be seated. And again I direct your attention to the New Testament uh, portion that was read to us. And in particular I focus your thoughts upon verses 7 and following and in particular that statement of Jesus when he says he who has seen me has seen the father he who has seen me has seen the father now throughout this series on John's gospel I have often reminded you of the fact that the gospel itself all concerns the word, the eternal word. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the theme of the gospel, is described by the apostle as the word who was made flesh and who dwelt among us. The word who is God together with the Father and we may say with the Holy Spirit. And at various times I have expressed variations on the theme of words. Words of love, words of truth, words of grace, words of salvation. And uh, it could be said this morning that the, the heart of the message concerns words of revelation. Because the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world, among other things, must be asserted as a revelation of the invisible God in visible form to mankind. The invisible God clothed himself with visibility when Jesus came into the world. He is our God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. He is God incarnate. And that's the glory of the Christian faith, isn't it? It's that makes it so unique and so utterly um, distinctive. Now last time we focused in particular on the famous verse 6, didn't we? Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we notice that Jesus is really reminding us that he is not just a way, but the way. He's not simply a truth, but the truth. He's not simply life, but the life. And then our closing hymn, you might remember, um, number 113, To God be the glory, great things he has done, included that line in the chorus, Come to the Father through Jesus the Son. And we see how that reflected indeed the truth of John 14 verse 6. Now we continue with the implications of what Jesus had said. But I would also just remind you, and I think it's particularly relevant this morning for reasons that I will very quickly explain, that there was a, a time when we were on the bookstall in Timber Hill, and you'll remember this particular story, but uh, I think it's relevant to mention this morning, that um, a young man from Cambridge came and he declared himself to me to be a Buddhist. And we had an interesting conversation. And then just um, uh, before he left, um, I said to him, I would like to remind you that uh, Buddha, shortly before he died, admitted that he had not found the truth. But we were there uh, in the city centre of Norwich in the name of one who said, I am the way the truth and the life. And off he went. And then about six months later, I had a wonderful letter from that same young man 
saying that that final exchange between us uh, opened his eyes and he became a Christian as a result. He accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as the way, the truth and the life. Now I mention that in the context of Buddhism because I'm sure you've been following the heart-rending developments uh, in Leicester following the, the death of the chairman of the of Leicester City Football Club. It's been so much uh, in the news uh, and it's a very moving uh, account uh, that we have both heard and, and seen on television. But I mention this because um, this dear man, and please forgive me, I haven't been able to master the proper pronunciation of his name, but you know who I mean. He was a greatly loved chairman of that football uh, club and uh, but Buddhism is simply not the answer and with his funeral uh, a lot of attention will be fixed upon Buddhism and this is the great danger of our culture in our time so much talk is given to multi-faith thinking so that the uniqueness of the Lord Jesus and what he says here in verse 6 is so easily lost. But So we must maintain, we must be conscious of what's going on and be firm in our minds and hearts of the uniqueness of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a leaflet, isn't there, which some of you distribute on Saturday mornings. Jesus, unique. And that's our claim and affirmation as, as Christians. Now then, as we have in the early part of, uh, of John 14 we're reminded that um, so much of what Jesus says here was a reply to the Apostle Peter's request he who wanted to go where Jesus was going and our Lord's words consist firstly of a reply to Peter uh, in which he says I go to prepare a place for you and then Thomas chips in with a question and says, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And then John 14, 6 is our Lord's answer to uh, Thomas. And now we have a request from one of the other disciples, Philip, in verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And that was in response to what Jesus said in verse 7, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. In which Jesus is simply saying, Everything that I've taught and, and done, everything that I am, it should be now very clear to you uh, who God the Father is. But Philip was still puzzled. Um, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient uh, for us. Uh, he's really simply saying this, Lord, will you show us what God is like? And that's often a question that people put to us. They say, you, you Christians, you believe in God. Uh, uh, what kind of God? How can we get our minds around the idea of, uh, uh, of the God of the universe, the God of, of e eternity? And... Um, if you turn to the systematic theologies and the treatises of the theologians, they will start to speak um, very profound ideas, sometimes a little incomprehensible. And uh, they come out with the three omnis concerning God. His omnipotence, that he's all-powerful. His omniscience, that he's all-knowing. And his omnipresence, that there's nowhere where he is not. But it's difficult to really relate to that kind of language. What are we talking about? Because God is so infinite as well as eternal. It's difficult for us to fully penetrate uh, these, these things. And uh, people often ask these sorts of, of questions. We are, of course, very close to the whole subject, which occasionally pops up in John, of the truth of the Trinity. Because here is Jesus talking about himself and also his father. And we must understand the importance of this um, particular truth. Because what we affirm as Bible-believing Christians is that um, there is, is one being of God, one being of such a divine nature, 
but there are three distinct individuals who all share that same nature. One God in three persons, and that's why we believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I can give you a little analogy. If I were to ask you how many human races there are, you would say, well, there's just one human race. Yes, not more than one, just one human race. If I was then to ask you how many human beings are there, you would say, well, there are millions. So we could say that's like millions in one. And that's something of the truth that we express when we believe in the Trinity. In other words, that God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, they are distinct, they are not to be confused, but they all share the same nature. All the attributes or characteristics or excellencies of God are shared by the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this really runs right the way through the Bible. So there is plurality in unity. And the Hebrew word for God, Elohim, is plural, it's not singular. So a lot of these things uh, need to be said when we hear Jesus saying, he who has seen me has seen the Father. He's not saying he is the Father, but what is he saying? He's saying something like this, that there is something of the Father in me. And I think one of the, the best biblical expressions of all this comes in Hebrews chapter 1, where the apostle there describes the Lord Jesus Christ as the express image of the Father. In other words, sometimes it's said of children, sons, and also sometimes daughters, oh, um, he's a chip off the old block, just like his father. And we could, in a very genuine sense, say that with this metaphor, that the Lord Jesus Christ is an important component of the eternal block who is the Father. Our dear friend and brother Hazlett Lynch put a, a, a new picture of himself up on Facebook this last week. And it's the most delightful picture, and I, I said so. And uh, one of his friends in Northern Ireland actually made the comment, you're just like your dad. Now that really is what we're saying about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he was implying here when he says, he who has seen me has seen the Father, like Father, like Son. Now this is such a, an important truth. Sometimes the question has been asked, uh, of the three persons of the Godhead, who has been most neglected? Well, there was a time when the Charismatics were saying, well, uh, you reform people, you don't have much to say about the Holy Spirit, which is an absolute falsehood, but that's their impression. I think it may be safe to say that if any one of the Godhead tends to be ignored, or rather forgotten, it is God the Father. It's right that we emphasize God the Son, the Bible does that constantly, but for the very reason that Jesus gives here. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So the fatherhood of God is a, is a vital and important truth for us to keep in mind. I think it's true to say too that in recent years there has developed a crisis concerning fatherhood. Hasn't there? <clears throat> From what one hears... The nation is awash with absentee fathers through divorce and various pressures. And uh, with all the concern about knife crime in London, two more teenage victims this last week, it's so grieving to hear this. One wonders whether the fathers are not around as role models, proper role models to give guidance and authority to to their sons. I believe this is probably um, very much um, the case at the, at the present time, a crisis in fatherhood. And also I think it must be added, and I say this in all honesty and fairness, there is an aggressive type of feminism which is tending to undermine men in taking responsibility for their manhood and for their lives. So there is, I believe, something of a crisis in fatherhood. And it's spilled over into the church in this sense that there are lots of new age sort of Christians 
who say, well, we should pray to God as our mother. Mother God, you've probably come across such people as well. And I believe all this is a, a, a features of a culture which is moving away from the Bible. It's moving away from the historic Christian truth. It's moving away from what the Lord Jesus Christ is uh, reminding us here. He who has seen me, he says to Philip, has seen the Father. Such a vital truth um, this is. What remains for me to say this morning uh, could also be described as what the old Puritans used to call a sacramental meditation. Because I want just to focus for a, a short time on the fact of the presence of God the Father uh, in the Gospels concerning the Lord Jesus himself because of what Jesus says here. And uh, just five examples I give you, very brief ones. First of all, we see the Father in Christ's birth, do we not? After all, John has said he is the Word made flesh and who dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth yes we see the father in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and going back to the the now deceased uh, Leicester football club chairman I was struck yesterday afternoon that one of the Leicester fans described this man a very kind man uh, a man you could talk to and this fan actually said to him, uh, said to the um, uh, reporter, um, he became one of us. And I thought, that's exactly right. That's exactly true of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he became one of us. He became man. He became human. God came down to be one of us in the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we may genuinely say that God the Father was present there in the, the incarnation and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then secondly, we see God the Father in Christ's boyhood, don't we? And my following few references all come from the Gospel of Luke. Remember this in Luke chapter 2 and verse 49, the occasion when uh, Mary and Joseph had lost track of Jesus on their way back from the Passover, they're going back to Nazareth and Jesus wasn't in the, the caravan going north and they had to rush back to Jerusalem. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? And they found him in the temple, you may remember. And... Um, and, and this is what uh, we read in Luke 2.48. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. She had forgotten momentarily that uh, Joseph was not the father of Jesus. And that's why Jesus went on to say, in verse 49, he said to them, Why is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business, his heavenly father, the divine eternal father of whom he was the human projection? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the words which he spoke to them. They did in due course, but they didn't then. So we see God the father in Christ's boyhood. And then we see God the Father in Christ's ministry. Again, back to Luke chapter 3 and verse 22. At the baptism of Jesus, listen to this. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You see? God the Father is present there. And then again in chapter 9 and verse 35. The Mount of Transfiguration, the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we read there? This is Luke 9 verse 35. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. So you see the important connection of this. 
Everything that Jesus said may be regarded as the voice of the Father coming to the human race. So it's an important truth, isn't it? So we see that to be the case there. And then, of course, we shouldn't forget in relation to our Lord's parables, in the parable of the prodigal son, God the Father is depicted there, isn't he? We've seen this in a recent study where I will just read from verse 18 words that Jesus uses to describe the language of the penitent son. Luke 15 verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And then listen to this. The gospel of God the Father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That is God the Father of whom Jesus was speaking. Now this is beautiful truth, isn't it? Uh, we should therefore be very careful to reaffirm the fatherhood of God as revealed in the scriptures. And then fourth, we see God the Father in Christ's death, don't we? Again in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. Luke 23 and verse 34. Jesus' prayer on the cross. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And then again, the last words that Jesus uttered. Verse 46 of Luke 23, when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. But then fifth and last in relation to the Lord's Supper, I want equally to affirm that we see the Father in the Lord's Supper. We see the Father in the Lord's Supper. <coughs> Why do I say that? Well, let's not forget John's greatest gospel statement in this gospel. Yes, and I never tire of quoting it. John 3.16, which are the words of Jesus, when he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have, a, have everlasting life. There has been a strange view over the years in which uh, it has been said that um, uh, without the, the death of Jesus, without the crucifixion, God could not have loved us. And there's a sort of a truth in that, but it's only a half-truth in this sense. It was the love of God the Father towards the world that caused him to send his Son. So really, we may truly say that in John 3.16, we think about the gift of the only begotten Son on whom we are to trust for our salvation. But it was God the Father's love that sent the Son to love us. He came to love us because God the Father loves us. So I think you'll agree that it's utterly wrong to allow the idea that the Father should be pushed into the background and marginalised in our, our thinking. And I'd like to remind you too that even John Calvin in his commentary on John 3.16 actually says that the Heavenly Father does not desire the human race that he loves to perish. And we shouldn't forget that there is a general universal love of God the Father for the human race, as well as a special love of God the Father for his church and for his people. We must recognize what the Bible says. In Acts chapter 17, for example, the Apostle Paul is very careful to speak of, in a creative sense, that every member of the human race is the offspring of God. 
But then in a special sense, when a person is born again of the Holy Spirit, they are put into the family of God's redeemed people. And then in a special sense, we're able to pray, Our Father, who is in heaven. So it's so very, very important to, to, to think in these terms. And uh, we can't forget that rather beautiful statement, stepping ahead, as it were, in John 16, and where Jesus says in verse 27, For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. What a remarkable statement that is. Yes, there's no doubt that Jesus loves the disciples. We, we saw a couple of weeks ago that having loved them, he loved them to the end. But Jesus is saying, it isn't only I who love you, but the Father loves you. And we could say, that's why God the Father has sent his Son as an expression of his amazing love towards this rebellious human race. Yes, it's true to say that there is a sense in which no member of the human race is totally unloved even though those who believe the gospel have that special love from the Father. And what Jesus says there to the disciples, John 16, 27, applies not only to the disciples, it applies to you and me, to every Christian brother and sister we know, all those for whom we have prayed, all those for whom we are concerned in all their troubled circumstances. We are to remind them, and none of us should ever forget, that the Father himself loves you. And I want you to be, sure of this, uh, to be sure of this, my dear friends, this morning. I say in the name of your Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ, that your Heavenly Father loves you. Please be persuaded of that, because it comes from our Saviour's own lips. So all these things are very precious truths. It should um, rehabilitate the idea of fatherhood. Yes, we cannot deny that fathers have often failed their children. I don't know of any human father that hasn't at some stage and in some degree been a failure to his children. And I'm no exception to that. But it does mean that we must avoid the feminist kind of take on human relationships and get back to the biblical no, there's to be no prayer to God the Mother. Why? Because at the end of all argument, when people ask that question, when the disciples said to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, teach us to pray, what did he say? Our Father in heaven. That's the end of the argument, if you're going to follow the Bible rather than New Age nonsense, which is so prevalent at the present time. So then when we come to think of the Lord's Supper, it's right and proper that we do that which Jesus has commanded. It's right and proper that we pray that our living Lord Jesus Christ should preside at his, at his own table. It means this too, doesn't it? That as we partake of the bread, we look by faith beyond the bread to the Lord Jesus. When we drink of the cup, we look beyond the wine to the Saviour who shed his blood for us. But from what we've seen this morning, we should go one step further and say that we should look beyond the elements to our Heavenly Father, the Father who sent the Son. And the Trinity are involved there because faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? So we come to the Lord's Supper truly in this Trinitarian manner. It is God the Father who sent the Son. It is God the Father's love that is behind Calvary. It is God the Father, the loving Father, who ultimately makes sense of the meaning of the bread and of the wine. Which is just another way of saying that receiving the Lord Jesus Christ is receiving the Father. Indeed, to reject the Lord Jesus Christ is to reject the Father then you see, to return to the beginning of John 14, this being the case when we believe in him and 
cast ourselves upon his mercy. Then verse 2 of John 14 shines that little bit brighter. What do I mean? Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, in my Father's house, constantly therefore, there is this reference by the Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning when we have the Lord's Supper, uh, we will look beyond the elements to Christ, but we will also look beyond them to the Father. Such a precious truth when you see it in this particular way. So it's so important for us to understand. Jesus said to Philip, Have I been with you so long, yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else... Believe me for the sake of the works themselves. In other words, at least let my works speak to you. That the Father is behind everything that I am and have said and have done and am yet to do when I come to Calvary's cross. It's tremendous, isn't it? It's refreshing to look at the fullness of truth when you examine exactly what Jesus Said. We have such a rich message, such a glorious gospel, which our Saviour has focused us upon this morning. Have I been with you so long, yet you have not known me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. And there's a final comment which has, if you like, an evangelistic aspect to us, because we should not be concerned simply to keep the Father's love to ourselves, but to spread it as far and wide as we possibly can. That whenever someone says to you, uh, how can I know something about God? How can I understand what God is like? What should your short, snappy answer be? If you want to know about God, go to Jesus. Now you can't say that if you have a low view of Christ. If you follow the Jehovah's Witnesses. Or others, the Unitarians and the Muslims who deny that Jesus is God incarnate. You can't say that. But when you see the, the full truth of the scriptures, when people say to you, where can I go to find out about God? So you send them to Jesus. And the more we understand him and everything that he said and did, the more we will understand God. We can't understand him from a philosophical and profound theological aspect with a whole load of technical phrases and language but you can see him in his son in his words, in his teaching, in his love and his kindness, in his purity and his holiness so next time if anyone asks you where can I go to find out about God you say, you go to Jesus why? because he said he who has seen me has seen the Father. Let's be clear about that and may the Lord help us to be his witnesses and to proclaim the gospel oh, dare I say it in these troubled and confused times. But let us then as we come to the Lord's Supper, remember we look beyond the elements to Jesus himself but also to the loving Father who loved us in his Son, our Saviour. Amen. And now we will sing our final hymn, which is number 732. <clears throat> 732. Lead us, Heavenly Father, lead us o'er the world's tempestuous sea. Guard us, guide us, keep us, feed us, for we have no help but Thee. Yet possessing every blessing, if our God, our Father, be Hymn 732. Lead us, Heavenly Father, lead us, 
And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the blessing of the Holy Spirit rest upon us and remain with us this day and forevermore. Amen.